All right, so let's we're going to go ahead and get started with the presentation. So we put together the this slide deck, and, and Chris and I hate nothing more than just kind of just a, a wall of words when it comes to presentations. So we've got obviously some slides to kind of guide the conversation. Uh, but as Mike mentioned, please don't hesitate to reach out with any questions. And you know, if we want to steer the conversation in a specific direction, we're happy to do that. Um, I know we've got kind of a mixture of different backgrounds for attendees on the call. You know being at more kind of strategic level to the technical folks. So we haven't focused too much on, on either end of that spectrum. We can geek out and get into the weeds with some technical stuff or kind of keep it high level and strategic if, if that's the direction you want to go as well. So um, so just to kind of get started, let me, uh, we've already kind of covered who Chris and I are. Um, just to, to, to kind of highlight the fact that everything we do is Kind of offensive in nature, right? We are the people who kind of emulate the attackers. We perform penetration tests and application security assessments and spear phishing and social engineering assessments, right? Um, the entire goal is really to perform technical controls validation to show, you know, the efficacy of your security controls. How well is it actually working to mitigate and prevent or detect an attack? Um, as well as, you know, where your main deficiencies are where you can invest your dollars to basically get the biggest bang for your buck and kind of eliminate or, or treat risk, right? Um, that's that's kind of our whole purpose. And we partner with Marco um, just to kind of have that, uh, you know, separation of duties, uh, I think, to, to so there isn't a conflict of interest between parties, right? A lot of times organizations require kind of a third party, an unbiased um, organization to perform kind of this validation. And that's that's kind of our main role. Um, so with that said, I want to kind of step back. I know this is this this conversation is focused primarily on spear phishing, but we want to look at it kind of in the overall frame of how a breach occurs in a typical course of action. Um, so you can look at things like the Verizon breach report and, and other things that are published by by different security vendors, right? And, and they do a pretty good job of talking about common attack patterns and whatnot. So what we're framing this as is kind of our approach to um, to attacking an organization when given kind of the freedom to emulate an attacker, right? Where there's really no tight rules of engagement. Let's talk about kind of the, the actual progression of what that attack looks like um, from um, kind of the, the, the inception of the engagement all the way through uh, to completion, right? And so a common attack pattern kind of follows what we've shown on the screen here. Um, working from kind of left to right. There's a spectrum uh, th that each of these, these components essentially align relative to how, um, how likelihood of, the, uh, uh, of how loud it is, essentially, how likely it is to, to get detected, um, but also the successfulness of the attack itself, right? So kind of working from left, left to right, we're looking at kind of the, the passive um, covert type activities all the way to the right side where it's a little bit more active and over, right? So the, the likelihood of, of detection and, and uh, you know, an organization actually catching us in our activities uh, increases the, the further right you go on this chart. So um, there is kind of a direct correlation between these activities, how likely we are to actually exploit, uh, you know, an organization or a vulnerability. Um, the more likely that is, there's also kind of that direct correlation between how likely an organization is to actually detect our activities. So as an attacker, we basically, we want to start from kind of that covert approach, right? Very passive, things that, that can't be detected very easily because we don't want to get ourselves burned very early in the process, right? We want to increase as an attacker kind of our likelihood of success relative to the overall engagement, right? And really stress test an organization's capabilities to detect our activities. So, uh, we've highlighted basically four uh, stages to kind of our common attack pattern. So it's starting with recon reconnaissance, which is uh, highly passive, right? We'll, we'll dive into these a little bit more on the next slides. Uh, reconnaissance to kind of perimeter network attacks to social engineering, uh, which is where we'll focus on, on the spear phishing, uh, all the way to possible physical, um, you know, on-site or in-person attacks. So kind of your goal as a defender is really to create enough friction so that the cost or effort or the chance of detection is such that it outweighs whatever the value is of a successful attack, right? So you're basically trying to trip me up enough so I, I, I basically give up because whatever I'm, I'm pursuing is, is not worth the amount of effort it would actually take to exploit the organization. Um, and I kind of liken this to the uh, the approach of like if you're 
if you're running from a bear, right? The, the kind of that analogy. Uh, if you and your friend are running from a bear, you don't necessarily have to be faster than the bear, but you got to be faster than your friend, that type of thing. So if <laughs> you cause enough friction, well, essentially they're going to look for that bear is going to look for your friend, right? Um, and that, that that's kind of the analogy here. Um, so looking specifically at reconnaissance, this is nearly 100% passive activity. Now, I will say it's nearly 100% because we might look at, at, if we're targeting an organization, we may look at things that are um, located on the website, right? Things like press releases, merger and acquisition information, you know, other, other types of relationships or extranets that might exist. Um, but it's nearly 100% passive. When we're looking at things like social media, um, we're using uh, search engines to uh, to Google very specific information about an organization. Uh, company publications and public breach dumps are also valuable valuable resources. The whole purpose of the reconnaissance part um, is really just to start to develop potential attack vectors against an organization. Um, this will help you know help us kind of profile the organization so that we know what what types of technologies are in use. What uh, uh, you know, based off perhaps what job vacancies there are or, or what people's job roles are on LinkedIn, for instance, right? We can start to kind of identify what technologies are in use. Um, I think I heard somebody unmute. Was there a question, comment? Yeah, Dan, I was going to ask, can you give, uh, maybe just give a few examples of the things that you found in this phase that really surprise some of your clients? Yeah, so. That they would uh, expect. Yeah, so kind of around the public breach dumps, um, that's always interesting. So if we look at things like pastebin, um, a lot of times if an organization's been breached, we can we can actually search for things like email addresses and whatnot, and it might reveal things like uh, uh, like user credentials, right? Uh, public breach dumps like uh, LinkedIn, Adobe, Ashley Madison, all of those um, uh, credentials from those that have been cracked have been publicly released. And so what we do is, we've actually scoured those breach dumps for credentials that belong to the organization. So a lot of people use their, their, their organization's email address to register with these sites, right? Um, if we identify credentials that were revealed, um, a lot of times in plain text or they were, they were already cracked or whatever because they were stored insecurely, we'll do what's called credential stuffing. So we'll take the credentials from those breach dumps and we'll attempt to replay them against say uh, O365 or some other you know, Active Directory um, authentication portal uh, for the organization. And, um, you know, that's a viable way for us to actually guess credentials. Or a lot of times it's just enough to figure out what their password pattern preferences are, right? So if, if an individual is, let's, I'm based in Nebraska. So let's say they're a huge Huskers fan. So it could be, you know, Huskers, you know, 2021, right? Well, okay, well, next year they'll probably pick Huskers 2022. Right, and so we can basically start to figure out patterns like that, and, and that can be kind of a useful way for us to actually get into an organization. Chris, did you want? Did you have any other examples? That that, that was the first one that came to mind. No, that's a pretty good one. I mean, that's it's typically it's typically just kind of composition, uh, and then if we can uh, if we can identify kind of what the password uh, the, the password complexity is of the organization, sometimes that actually translates directly, like you said, from a password stuffing attack going from. The actual breach dump data over to you know the, the organization and then the other thing that's typically enlightening to them is that they have no idea that that information is actually out there right so we'll pull back you know hundreds of uh uh you know like email addresses and things like that that are associated with the organization they'll say well how did you get that that kind of information and we say well you know we scoured all the dumps we pulled everything we maintain uh, an ongoing uh, an ongoing list uh, of that data, and it's publicly available for everyone, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, predicating the, the the social engineering attack with that kind of data isn't isn't hard at all. So, so it, it, we also have instances like on on Facebook, for instance, when somebody gets a new job at an organization, they like to post the picture of their badge to prove, like, hey, I got a new job, congratulations to me. So, what we can do is actually we can look at that badge, what it looks like, craft craft a new one, basically a fake one. Of course, it's not going to work against like an RFID reader or anything like that. Um, but a lot of times just having a badge that looks real displayed kind of publicly when we walk into a building um, is just enough for people to believe that we belong there. Search engines, we found configuration files and, and backup files. 
um, that shouldn't be publicly exposed that have led to compromise of perimeter assets. So, I mean, there's a number of different things and it's really hard to, to maintain a small information footprint when you might have thousands of employees that are, you know, leaking that information. Okay, so the reconnaissance isn't, since it's not a super, you know, active type um, activity, um, the likelihood of us actually breaching an organization via reconnaissance is, again, it's, it's, it's a passive uh, ish activity, right? Um, so we might have enough information to craft a specific, uh, for instance, social engineering campaign or ruse that's relative to the organization, but it also kind of helps us uh, identify what types of perimeter hosts and applications and things they might actually have exposed. And so this is where we start to move into the more active uh, activities. So this is the second stage of, of the attack is us actively interrogating the perimeter network assets. So we're looking at things like, uh, you know, we're running port scans, uh, very light port scans. We're looking at applications to see if there's any, you know, common authentication bypass, if you have any kind of, um, you know, OWASP top 10 type issues, if you're familiar with some of those web application vulnerabilities, right? Um, we're looking at kind of easy wins through the perimeter network that could get us a foothold on the internal network. This is obviously less covert. I'm sorry, did you have a comment, a question? Yeah, I was just going to say this is also this is also a perfect time where we would actually look for things like you know remote desktop protocol if it's, if it's uh, publicly exposed, right? So you know, there's a lot of chatter around you know RDP and taking advantage of multiple um, multiple RDP vulnerabilities to gain access into the environment. This is the stage in which you know we would actually go look uh, go look for this kind of uh, this kind of information, kind of the reconnaissance and perimeter network attack phase. So yeah, yeah. So if you have kind of a superfluous uh, you know service. Uh, you know, services exposed if your access control lists aren't, aren't buttoned up. Um, this is kind of where it, it starts to show itself, right, as, as a real vulnerability. Um, now, the, the, good, the good thing for us as attackers is that we blend in with all this other traffic. You know, your perimeter network is, is butt, butting up against a hostile network in the internet, right? You're getting hit with this type of malicious activity day in, day out, 24 by 7, right? Um, so our activities blend in kind of nicely with that. So it makes it a little bit, I think, more covert than, than some of the other stuff, right? We kind of just blend in with that noise itself. We also uh, will do things like use non-attributable inf infrastructure, you know, the, uh, the adoption of, of uh, you know, cloud resources and whatnot um, will a lot of times, you know, leverage AWS, Azure, um, things of that nature to actually you know, generate uh, hosts from which we can actually launch attacks. So it kind of masks our, our direct IP addresses. We'll use redirectors. We'll do all sorts of things just to make it not so obvious that it's coming from us, right? Um, this is also where we might consider doing things like watering hole or supply chain attacks. Now I say supply chain attacks are probably fairly rare, but it's been in the news lately with the solar winds um, issue. A watering hole attack, if you're not familiar with that, is essentially looking at, um, possibly information from the reconnaissance stage uh, to identify a relationship that you might have. Or for instance, let's let's say we, we looked at LinkedIn and we find out that your, your employees commonly go to the same Chinese food restaurant that's right next door to your headquarters. Well, what we might do is attack the Chinese food restaurant's website, compromise their, uh, you know, their, their order form or their website to basically plant malware in your employees browsers as they use the uh, the site to order food right now that's i will say that's not part of our standard operating procedure because we don't have permissions to, to to do that but you know state nation state actors organized crime things uh you know groups like that um that's that's a legitimate attack vector for them um <clears throat> so i mentioned uh you know the the active you know packets that we're sending via you know port scans uh service fingerprinting um, and kind of cataloging the, uh, the organization overall. Um, attackers, they could very well just run vulnerability scans against your perimeter assets if they're taking that, you know, kind of the bull in the China shop approach, just throwing everything uh, just to see what you have exposed. Um, the unfortunate thing about the perimeter network is if we find a vulnerability that's exploitable, 99.9% .9 of the time, we're not the first ones to find it, right? And you've probably got a bigger problem on, on, on your hands. All right, so now we're getting into the social engineering. So this is <clears throat> kind of the, the, the third phase of our overall course of action. 
is kind of the, the topic of, of this this call here. I've already spent I think 20 minutes of the call not talking about social engineering, but we're here. Um, so yeah, this is kind of the third phase of what our attacks would actually look like. So social engineering includes things not only spear phishing in, in the form of email phishing, but maybe phone pretexting, right, or vishing, um, SMS phishing, uh, malicious media drops, whether we're we're mailing uh, you know malicious USB drives to employees, things of that nature. So there's kind of a whole catalog. Uh, of different social engineering attacks that, that we can perform. Of course, spear phishing in the form of email phishing is probably the most common that you're getting hit with, you know, day in and day out. However, just as successful, if not more successful, and a lot of times more attractive from an attacker's perspective might be phone pretexting because the ability to actually track, um, detect, and, and um, I think maybe uh, triage those types of attacks are a little bit more difficult for organizations. But of course, it, it requires the social engineer to you know, talk to and lie to an individual face to face, and that's not always comfortable. Um, but yeah, so the email phishing is, is uh, definitely uh, one of the most common uh, methods for us to actually breach an organization. It's been like that for, for years now, right? A lot of times we don't, we don't actually breach a perimeter via the perimeter network attack, but then it falls into the social engineering piece of it. And if that doesn't work, that's where we can kind of start to look at, you know, the physical or in-person attacks. This uh, is, is not nearly as likely to occur because it is such a high risk um, to the attacker in terms of getting, you know, detected, arrested, you know, whatever that looks like. Um, however, as part of our assessments, if this is scoped in, then this is usually kind of that fourth phase of the overall assessment um, where we're actually, you know, picking locks, uh, cloning badges, using grappling hooks. We got accused, uh, we were asked during a scoping call if we would be rappelling out of helicopters or down buildings and that, and that we don't do, but I guess someone watches a lot of movies, but that's okay. Um, but a, a big purpose of this, and the, so there's a high likelihood of compromise as for, for this part of the assessment, because you know a lot of times it's easy to tailgate in to, to an organization, right? And then, you know, if we place a, a Dropbox on the network, if you don't have a sufficient NAC in place or we can bypass it or, you know, what have you, um, there's a pretty high likelihood that we can actually get access to the internal network by simply going on site for an hour or two, right? And as I mentioned, you know, impersonating employees via crafting a, a, a legitimate looking badge or just cloning someone's badge when they walk to, a, you know, a Starbucks down the street is a very realistic attack uh, attack vector as well. So another thing to remember, another thing to remember with a lot of this, right, is that, you know, everyone's risk tolerance is different. And a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these things have to align with your specific organization. So if we're looking at something like a physical in-person attack, um, in, in just kind of across the board for all of these is that a lot of times what we're trying to do is we're trying to replicate a threat that, is, that has motive and has capacity. Right. So if you've got someone that's going to take the uh, go to the extent, if you've got a threat that's actually going to go to the extent of an in-person attack, then you, most likely you're a high value, you're a high value target. Right. You're you possibly like, you know, some kind of nation state or something like that, trying to implant a, per, implant a person uh, for like a supply chain attack, uh, those types of things. Right. So there's varying levels. A lot of times what we'll end up doing is we'll land on social engineering. Right. And there's a number of things that can lead up to that social engineering, or you might have someone that's just doing like a you know, ransomware as a service or something like that. And they're just firing off a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of emails and that, that kind of thing in hopes to get something to land in the organization, right? Because um, low effort, high value, uh, high value reward. So it's, again, just, uh, you know, things things are across the board. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to align with, uh, you know, the, the, the level of risk that's, uh, or, or sorry, the, the value of the, the actual organization, so. Yeah, and I think to, to Chris's point, trying to align it with the organization, a big a big part of what we do for the social engineering and or physical side of the attacks is all predicated on what we find during the reconnaissance phase. Phase, so it feeds really heavily into that. Um, just in terms of you know who who can we impersonate? Um, uh, you know, are using you know multi-factor, single-factor, and authentication portals? Uh, you know, if we can impersonate a, a, an admin. Uh, like a service desk uh, admin, um, just because we can identify them on LinkedIn or, or, or what have you, right? I mean, that's that's all very, very important. 
Okay, so Andrew, Chris, I guess one, one question for you on that. So the in-person attacks, I think you guys hit it, right? Everybody, everybody assumes that, hey, that's just a Hollywood thing. Yeah. We all know that it does actually happen, but do you see any industry maybe more susceptible to that than another? Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Hand about Dan. Go ahead. Well, I was, all I was going to say, you can add your, your comment too. I was just going to say the susceptibility a lot of times is based off of the organization. Are, are they like a retail organization that requires some type of public access? That always makes it way harder. So like a hospital, for instance, there's going to be some type of public access in there that a lot of times actually segmenting where those kind of, the, you know, the high security zones almost becomes more difficult because you've got constant traffic of people coming and going anyway. That it's harder to track. Anyway, Chris, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so the other thing that I was going to say is process networks. Um, so a lot of times what we end up seeing from a manufacturing standpoint is you've got a bunch of you know you've got a bunch of folks that are coming and going uh, in that uh, in that particular OT or process space, right? Um, there's a lot of legacy systems. There's a lot of US uh, abilities to like you know uh, jack USB into uh, USB ports, um, those types of things. And there's not a whole lot of people looking to you know kind of validate the individuals that are uh, that are within the environment, right? Uh, most of the time. It's it's not necessarily like a clean room type of situation, but you're you know you're wearing like you know something that doesn't really differentiate yourself from the next person. Um, so we typically what we end up seeing is yeah okay there's there's definitely susceptibility. There's not a lot of challenge response type of things that are going on there. Um, so yeah, that's there's there's definitely definitely some vulnerability that's associated with that. So. Yeah, those, those those types of networks, people just kind of put their head down and go about their work more so than I, I would say others. So it's. Uh, Despite the fact that they may know, you know, a higher percentage of people that are supposed to be in the environment, they also have a lower uh, likelihood of actually challenging you when you're on site. I, well, I like. Yeah, yeah. So, like corporate environments, we typically see a challenge, right? So, if we're going to do one of these exercises, we'll see a challenge. Someone will, someone will typically out us or, or something like that. But in in uh, in those environments, not not necessarily uh, so much. And they're also they're also extremely high value targets, right? I mean, again, if you want to get into, you know, I'm not. I, I'm not going to, you know, pick on supply chain or anything like that. But uh, you've got a lot of folks um, that grew up in uh, IT. Uh, potentially, they turned. Uh, they needed some. Uh, they needed someone that was, uh, you know, kind of security minded or transitioned to security. Right. They kind of grew into that role, um, and they, you know, it's, again, this is just from our experience. We haven't seen a whole lot of. Uh, there, there's just there's just a, a deficiency there um, to. There's, there's a deficiency to challenge folks um, that uh, aren't necessarily, you know, to identify those folks and, and that sort of thing that shouldn't necessarily be there. So, yeah, yeah, good point. <clears throat> okay, so this like we're going to talk a little bit about the uh, the evolution of fishing. So I would say 10, 15 years ago, uh, fishing was a slam dunk success. It was kind of a no brainer in terms of how easy it was. Where we, you could get code execution on 50% of the targets, right? Half the time it wouldn't even be escalated internally or stopped. Um, after you did get code execution and you had basically command and control shell to all these user workstations, it was really hard to eradicate that threat as well, right? Because they didn't have good uh, telemetry, uh, you know, uh, visibility into into the network, right? So um, that that was kind of a different time, especially because. Not only was code code execution so prevalent and easy, but there was also kind of this prevalence of single factor authentication on the external network. So even if code execution wasn't a, a viable attack vector, credential harvesting um, could lead to a widespread compromise. You know, a single set of user credentials a lot of times could be used to authenticate to the VPN, right? Which we we're on the internal network at that point. Uh, business email compromise. You know, any any other type of system. Uh, that authenticates, especially with like Active Directory that was exposed publicly, um, is kind of a, a viable way to get a foothold into an organization. Not to mention that, you know, 10 years ago or so, the kind of the first generation of antivirus, I would say it was still kind of the first generation. Um, it was more of a decoy than it was effective, right? Uh, the, the ability to bypass antivirus a lot of times involved just changing an executable signature, which could be as easy as adding a single byte to the end of a binary file, right? Uh, something super simple like that. Now, modern day, we've come a long way in 10 or 15 years, and it makes, as practitioners, Chris and my, it makes it a lot harder. Um, but 
that's kind of why we're, we're, we're in this business, right? Is that we're trying to help kind of evolve this, this practice, right? So modern day, we're looking at modern operating systems have come a long way in terms of their, their ability to, to proactively identify malicious software. Uh, regardless of the format, whether it's a binary format or macro or, you know, what have you. Um, things like AMZ Defender, um, there's publications from Microsoft for like the tax surface reduction, like their best best practices for, you know, configurations to basically harden an environment, prevent this code execution. Like the, the information is, is amazing to, to help harden these operating systems. We've also got more granular egress restrictions. It's harder for us to talk outbound. Um, so if we get code execution, if we can't get connection back to our, our our C2 server, it's kind of what's the point? It makes it makes it quite a bit more challenging, right? Um, the increased adoption of multi-factor authentication, although this isn't ubiquitous across all of our organizations that we test, um, the the percentage that are using MFA across the board is is much higher, meaning that. Stealing credentials can only get us so far. A lot of times it may be even useless for us to run some type of credential harvesting campaign where we spoof a, a login portal just to grab, you know, user credentials. Uh, instead, we have to look at things like, okay, how can we, how can we compromise this MFA portal? How can we um, basically steal user sessions to your single sign-on portal, uh, which may grant us access for a short, short amount of time, a day, um, rather than, you know, if we had, uh, credentials kind of the old way 10 years ago, it would be kind of indefinite. Um, it makes it quite a bit more difficult and it also increases the pressure for us to make <laughs> make something happen in say 12 hours time before that session expires. Um, we've also got more more effective, you know, brand protection and takedown if we stand up a domain name um, that's similar to the target um, that, that we're spoofing. Uh, that's usually detected fairly well within 24 or 48 hours and take it down, right? Uh, for organizations that actually deploy that, that type of solution. Uh, the threat intelligence, uh, also next generation endpoint security. This is, this is a big one. This, um, you know, we're not married to any product specifically, but uh, this, this is a huge thorn in our side and, and has, we, we target if we have the intelligence to know which systems have certain endpoint products on it, a lot of times it's easier for us to just avoid those systems and go after legacy systems that don't have that stack rather than target you know, those systems and try to bypass execution of something like a CrowdStrike or uh, Carbon Black, Silence, you know, those, those Sentinel ones. That's a big point. And that's one that if you take anything away from this entire slide, uh, making our jobs and a lot, a lot of uh, just you know, adversaries in general, uh, the EDR solution uh, itself. If you're not running, if you're not running an EDR solution, I would definitely look into something, getting something that actually has, you know, behavioral analytics. It has some kind of machine learning, um, and I know those are bu that's buzzword bingo. But I'm just I'm just saying that there there's a lot of value in that, um, and maybe not from the initial foothold, but you know, say for instance, post exploitation, post compromise, being able to get. Uh, high fidelity uh, telemetry and and you know just 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 insight into what a, pot a potential threat is doing within your environment. Uh, it's an absolutely wonderful way to uh, take advantage of a commercial product that is going to pay dividends. Right. So, just leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely agree. And that's kind of a good good transition into this one. So I'll. I'll <clears throat> It's kind of a wall of text. We don't have to jump into each one of these word for word, but to Chris's point about the effectiveness of, of the EDR products, um, that second to last bullet point is kind of a big one. So uh, what actually happens now is can we bypass some of those products? Yeah, absolutely. We can we can develop a, a bypass that either you know unhooks it or uh, it just kind of works when when delivered and, and detonated on on uh, a workstation. The problem is that this cat and mouse game, the, the time between us being able to bypass it and the vendor actually catching up with what we've done has gotten so short that it may work one day and six hours later, it doesn't work anymore, right? And it's propagated to other vendors as well. So it's it's no longer like, yeah, you can just run Veil or whatever to, to obfuscate the, the, the binary and then it'll run fine for months at a time, right? No, we're, we're talking like hours, days max for a bypass would work, right? Um, so I will say that uh, 
for the modern day attacker, um, credential harvesting is still probably the path of least resistance to breaching an organization. So no longer is just the idea of email phishing the as kind of this whole concept the way into an organization. I would I would kind of narrow that scope and say email phishing, but credential harvesting is still probably the most effective. Detonating malicious uh, code on an endpoint is no longer um, is no longer a simple task. I'll say that. Um, the, the defenders, uh, I think, kind of the modernization of, of operating systems, security products, as well as organizational maturity over time, has has made that um, almost the the risk reward for the attacker is is, is not great, right? Um, however, uh, the big um, kind of the attack. Um, I guess uh, types that we do are, are focused almost primarily now on business email compromise. Not all the time. It, of course, it depends what an organization actually has exposed. But business business email compromise, even if you're using O365 or you know you've got on-prem uh, Exchange or whatever that you're using OA for, targeting those uh, portals and compromising those can make it much simpler for us to actually breach the organization and get code execution on. Um, on a workstation and or, you know, uh, widespread internal compromise. And I say that because a lot of times having access to one user's email, uh, email box, it, it lets us do a couple of things. We can dump the, go the global address list. Um, so basically all the users and objects or whatever in Active Directory so that we can then subsequently perform a password guessing attack. Right, and so that that kind of helps us, um, I guess, increase the the visibility that we would have if we compromise other other user accounts. Um, so there's that, but then it also increases the trustworthiness of any type of subsequent social engineering campaign that we choose to do. So if we want to launch a spear fish from a compromised user's email address, it looks a lot more um, uh, trustworthy coming from an, an internal organizational email address than it does externally, right? And it also bypasses some things like the mark of the web and, and, and things of that nature, right? That also might increase the, the ability to execute code. But, uh, you know, that in and of itself is a pretty big deal usually. <clears throat> um, so I would also say that, uh, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, let's, let's, drop, let's drop a poll. Okay, yeah, you wanna jump onto the, uh, this next one? Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Okay, yeah, so this is this kind of, um, for the second point here, um, yeah, we're putting the poll up uh, now, but it's basically the change of motivation for attackers has gone from breaching a full organization because it's almost more financially uh, beneficial um, to detonate ransomware. So this poll, you know, how does your organization prepare, prepare for ransomware attacks? So we'll give you guys a minute to, uh, to log in, to, to log your answer. All right, Chris, you wanna you wanna run through the uh, the poll results? Do you see them? Span this a little bit here. Yeah, I can. I'm I'm trying to trying to see them. <laughs> it doesn't show all of them. All right. Okay. Yeah, if you kind of mouse over it, it'll pop up. So. <laughs> ah, okay. Got it. Got it. All right. So we got. Uh, all right. So we've got a. Some folks that are not doing anything. We got some folks that are doing some tabletop exercises. No one's no one's really doing live fire. I like to see a couple of them. That's interesting. Um, and then doing okay, doing both. Yeah, <laughs> roughly a 30, 30, 30 split, right? Yeah, some people are doing this thin. Some people are doing tabletops, and then some people are all in. Um, yeah, and then tabletop, someone, live fire, everything. Yeah, someone's exposing RDP and and, and ransomware. 
Okay, cool. Yeah, this is um, all right. At least at least there's a there's a split. Um, but for the folks that aren't doing anything, I would uh, I would definitely suggest because because the migration of fishing has you know I, I think because it has shifted towards uh, you know kind of focusing more so on landing ransomware and you know kind of again ransomware of old days. Uh, and I'm not saying that this hasn't gone away. Is ransomware of old days has uh, essentially been, you know, uh, kind of an automated uh, adventure, right? So it would drop, it would do its thing, um, and you would get infected. Whereas, you know, if we're kind of looking at some of the more current uh, variants, now we've got human-operated ransomware, right? And human-operated ransomware uh, takes into consideration some of the things that you may have seen, you know, say, for instance, previous um, uh, previous webinars and things like that about, um, you know, uh, getting some command and control uh, associated with it. So. The ransomware lands, uh, you know, and it's in the environment, but nothing really happens yet, right? It's basically just setting up for additional further action. And that additional further action is establishing a foothold in the environment, being able to move laterally, being able to deploy more ransomware, being able to exfiltrate, being able to set up for further attacks. Um, so these are all very, very important things um, when you're kind of going through uh, your understanding of how to better prepare yourself for uh, something like a ransomware attack uh, and to include in a tabletop exercise. And if you're not familiar with the tabletop exercise, I know, uh, I know Mike and uh, Mike and Wes Spencer and, uh, you know, crew, they did, uh, they did some tabletops and things like that, which is wonderful. Um, kind of just walking through, uh, you know, basically just preparedness around what happens if something, something does happen, right? What happens if uh, it does, it does hit the organization? Are you prepared to give run books, give playbooks, give all those sorts of, uh, Items and then we take it a step further. And this is something that we typically do: is we do live fire exercises, uh, meaning that we will actually detonate ransomware um, that is uh, somewhat benign in the fact that we don't want it actually propagating throughout the network. But the cool thing about that is you can actually perform uh, not only tabletop uh, exercises, but also see what it takes to you know like mean time to recovery, right? Um, what 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 is your actual true rapid threat response within the environment? It's just a, another way to better prepare. Um, because you actually have something that is live fire that is actually happening um, to uh, kind of test your metal, if you will. So, all right, <clears throat> good deal. Let's see. <clears throat> I talk a lot. So, okay. um, yeah, Chris, you want to you want to dive into this, this slide? Yeah, of course. All right. So, when we're talking about phishing strategies, there's two uh, there's two ways that an organization can approach this. Um, and and typically, like you know, I know. Uh, Probably one of the questions is why should I why should I undergo a phishing you know why should I undergo a phishing attack that's more 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 technical right um, I already have you know a I already have a service that I pay for monthly phishing or quarterly phishing or whatever now one of the things I want to highlight here is that one is you know if we're looking at the leftmost side uh, we're looking at a security awareness campaign the rightmost side we're looking at a tactical campaign and left the leftmost side really kind of focuses on uh, something that's uh, more intent on metrics and statistics. So um, I'm not going to name out any services uh, specifically, but you know, if you're paying for like, say, for instance, a monthly uh, monthly subscription, a lot of times the thing is that it's more contrived in the fact that you have to whitelist it through the email gateway, right? Uh, and that's in order to deliver mass numbers of uh, emails to the recipients in order to get the metrics and statistics that you want associated with that campaign. Um, the delivery of the actual content. Um, may be very generic it might not align with the premise it might not align with the organization um you know it's like hey free coffee that sort of thing right and it's not necessarily tailored towards you know an actual specific spearfish associated uh to a threat actor threat actor that actually has motive capacity um so you got a number of uh, a number of things but i think the the biggest uh, the biggest takeaways are like kind of on the left side does not emulate a capable threat actor does not ass uh, assess the endpoint technical security controls is a big one uh and does not provide insight into uh, the enterprise attack res resiliency. And this is really more focused on the tactical, the technical aspects, right? So, you know, if you've just implemented, uh, you know, uh, uh, some kind of endpoint protection on your workstations while doing a security awareness campaign uh, does not take into consideration that. It's only around what your users are used to and it's conditioning your users to, you know, find little cues within the emails to prevent that. It's not really focusing on the overall attack chain, the endpoint all the way out back to, um, back to the uh, command and control infrastructure or whatever that may look like, the phishing infrastructure. And then on a tactical campaign, it's exactly the opposite. You might get some metrics and statistics by happenstance. It's serendipitous and how we would arrive at that maybe, but it's more so around um, 
really kind of assessing gateway security controls, your email gateway security controls. The one thing is we're not whitelisted, right? We're actually trying to get these things in, these emails into the recipients. Uh, and we want to take advantage of uh, things like Azure, right? And some of the misconfigured, not the misconfigurations, the features in Azure um, and taking advantage, advantage of misconfiguration depth within the organization, right? Because, you know, you might have things that are configured loosely, right? And it's not necessarily technical debt, it's misconfiguration debt, right? And we want to take advantage of that. Um, the other items would be that we would test your endpoint security controls. If you've got a new fancy, shiny EDR like CrowdStrike or something like that, does CrowdStrike prevent detonation of whatever payload, whatever malware we're actually sending into the organization? Um, so big differentiation is security awareness uh, phishing campaigns are just that. They're just to test your users, right? Your tactical campaigns, those are to test. They can test your users, um, but that's not necessarily the focus. The focus is really on the technical security controls to make sure that you have protected your organization from users doing things that you know that users are going to do. Um, it's just the, you know, it's just the, the, the nature of the game, right? Um, I'm going to fast forward to the next slide there, Dan. Okay, uh, and then I guess real quick, I mean, we'll, we'll kind of talk through some of the challenges. I know I wanna leave uh, about 10 minutes or so uh, to uh, discuss some things, but I definitely wanted for the, uh, for the tech nerds on the call, I definitely wanna kind of dig into uh, uh, some of the things uh, from an offensive challenge that we run into uh, and then how we handle those situations. So a lot of the fish engagements that we end up doing are more towards the right-hand side. Those are the tactical things, right? So we have to um, take into consideration when we're running those, uh, when we're, we're running our campaigns, when we're running our attacks, we're trying to get a foothold into the environment. We're trying to deploy ransomware. We're trying to, you know, do something that is going to be persistent and move us and perpetuate the attack, right? So we, for one, uh, always test the blue team. So we want to remain non-attributable. And that means that we have to abstract ourselves, uh, you know, some, some form fashion. And typically that's taking advantage of a cloud-based service um proxies bouncing through you know various geo regions those types of things we want to make sure that we're not attributable to a blue team and we want to test their metal um the other thing is being able to identify what is a valid network range when we're targeting a specific organization we target marco we want to specifically understand what marco's address range is so that means that we've got to do some preemptive things uh in order to uh get that uh, get that information uh the other item is contending with sandboxes uh, and these are anti-malware sandboxes. So if you're familiar with like, you know, so for instance, 0365, you send in uh, uh, an email, right? It's got some links. Well, what, what 0365 will end up doing is, you know, through, through uh, uh, smart link, smart screen, all that kind of stuff, but basically go out to their um, uh, anti-malware engine, right? Uh, and they will uh, inspect the, the, uh, the, uh, the HTML, the URL links, they'll inspect any attachments and those sorts of things. Um, so if we're sending in a payload, right? it might try to grab that and inspect where it's going. Uh, and if it sees that it's malicious, then no go, we're, we're cut off. And we wanna, we wanna, we wanna mitigate that. We're, we wanna have some level of assurance that we're actually getting it into the organization. C2 integration uh, is another big one. Um, and if you follow on some of the more technical things, you'll see, uh, you know, you'll see some of the uh, um, uh, ransomware uh, and just, you know, basically just some of the uh, command and control uh, information. You see things like Cobalt Strike, right? So in, in PowerShell Empire, you'll see a lot of these commercial off the shelf open source projects that are actually being baked into, uh, baked, baked into the, uh, um, uh, the actual malicious, you know, uh, threat campaign. Uh, we kind of touched on the blue team, the hunt. We want to be able to uh, really kind of get some kind of visibility uh, into what the blue team's doing, what the hunt team, what the IR uh, is doing, if we can. Um, so we're constantly logging absolutely everything that we see. Uh, when we send a fish in, we want to see exactly what's coming back, right? Um, before we even do anything that's malicious. Again, this is kind of preemptive network mapping. And then uh, we want to control the narrative, right? Um, as we're kind of going through, we want to make sure that, you know, if we do have a payload, uh, that we want it to be believable, um, that there are some sandbox bypasses that are believable that will um, allow the uh, payload to execute things like that. Because we put a lot of time into it. We put a lot of time into all of these campaigns, just like anyone that is worth their, worth their you know, again, worth their standard um, are, going to, uh, are going to do, right? They're going to have to tool up. They're going to have to create custom infrastructure. Uh, and they're going to have to really kind of test their tradecraft uh, in order to be able to effectively execute within within the uh, the target environment, Dan, can you uh, throw another slide up and we'll call it good? 
All right, so what we ended up doing um, for our own benefit is, uh, you know, uh, again, to carry our, our engagements uh, forward is we developed something called Red Proxy. Um, we use it internally, we'll probably eventually open source it. We were gonna open source it last year, um, but it just wasn't, uh, just wasn't ready. Um, so we've been kind of uh, adding on to it. But the thing that Red Proxy allows us to do uh, is stand up a cloud infrastructure, uh, put a proxy in front, of, uh, in front of that cloud infrastructure within the infrastructure and control all of those things, like I mentioned, the narrative, right? So we're doing things like, you know, as we actually see things, uh, um, see, you know, say for instance, we send a, a malicious fish into the organization. And as it's trying to make its call back to uh, get the, uh, you know, portion of that malware piece, right? Well, we see it come from uh, some place uh, and if it looks like it's a legitimate place and we've done our research and things like that, then we can have real time approval. That's what you're seeing in the rightmost uh, portion. It would go to our phones. We, we would have real time approval, right? Unless we know uh, some other um, uh, artifacts or remnants, public artifacts, I guess, of, uh, of you know, like IP address space, network block space, those sorts of things. Then at that point, we can automatically whitelist and allow that through. Um, we have the way to, you know, kind of take advantage of some uh, memory. Uh, you know, shell code um, decoupling, things like that, in order to bypass, uh, in order to bypass some detections. Uh, sandboxing again. Uh, we maintain an entire list of like what CrowdStrike, Sentinel One, uh, Amazon's AWS space, uh, Azure space, like all of these things, right? So if we if we send something in and it comes from a cloud-based uh, address that we don't necessarily want it to come from then we can not only block it, but one of the things that we'll end up doing is actually redirect it to a valid URL. So when the sandbox comes through and it inspects it, it's going to see something that's absolutely valid. And some of those uh, some of those products, they'll, it'll trip them up. They'll basically say, oh, well, this is fine. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to let it on through, right? And that gets us to the next step. That gets us to the next stage. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on here. But basically what I want to, what I want to uh, identify with this is that uh, again, we put a lot of effort into what we do from a tradecraft perspective to test the technical controls within the organization to mitigate phishing, to mitigate some ransomware things, uh, and basically those delivery vehicles. Um, they're not equivalent to those other monthly services. Um, it's a completely different, different, different thing. And I think with that, um, let's fast track this again and let's jump to yet another poll. Um, and then I think what we're going to do is yeah. wrap it up. I, I think as people months. are answering that, yeah, we're, we're coming up near the end here. So I think what people are answering that, uh, yeah. if we can actually hop back to that um, covert versus overt uh, operations, reconnaissance and whatnot, I think probably just spend the last five minutes kind of talking about what we can actually do to prevent this or to protect against it. So I think we'll give everyone a, last 30 seconds here to finish remaining or answering that poll before we jump into that <clears throat> okay one, one thing one thing that i do want to mention um dan do you have the ability to share uh that other document that's asking a lot chris it's a tall it's a tall order yeah <laughs> um yeah i don't know if i'll be able to pull it up here um So there are a couple questions that got asked here too, and we will address those uh, shortly after the poll. It's the PDF in there, Dan. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Okay. Thanks for those who answered the poll. Looks like we have about 40% not doing any sort of fishing on a regular basis. And then 40% are doing monthly and the rest are doing quarterly or annually. Gotcha. Okay, yeah, for those for those folks that, uh, those folks that are doing monthly and, uh, and quarterly um, and annually, uh, that's great. Um, 
and then for the folks that uh, that aren't really doing anything, um, you know, you got you got a decision to make, right? Um, you know, how you're going to uh, kind of implement uh, implement that. That kind of also goes or implement some kind of fishing uh, fishing awareness, and then also uh, I use those incorrectly. How you're going to implement uh, security awareness as well as you know some fishing fishing exercises and those sorts of things. So definitely uh, some room uh, as well as the folks that are uh, doing monthly, quarterly, and annually. I mean, if you're if you're just doing kind of security awareness uh, around the individuals uh, and you're not doing any of the uh, the technical testing, uh, definitely something to consider to uh, to include. But uh, it's good to see that some folks are doing doing, doing quite a bit. Um, this is a document that I would like to leave with you folks. Um, and it, you know, if you signed up on, uh, you know, obviously as you signed up for this webinar, uh, we put together kind of a uh, quick hit. Uh, it doesn't cover everything, but the idea is that it's it, it gets the conversation going. Um, and really, what we want to do is kind of leave leave you with uh, you know some things to think about when you're actually protecting your organization, um, and that kind of goes with protecting the cloud, protecting the enterprise. Uh, protecting the users, right? Um, and we want to make sure that uh, uh, that you have something tangible uh, to leverage. I know some of these things are kind of a tall uh, a tall order. Um, so that's another thing where you know uh, the joint venture between you know uh, uh, Marco and Stack Titan we can definitely uh, help help with uh, some of these things. Um, and so, John, to, to to your point about you know what can what can users do across that entire spectrum of of the different different portions of an attack chain. So for instance, like we take a look, you know, here, this is kind of addresses some of the major points that that we kind of see or that we, um, you know, things that we're able to exploit during our, our attack chains, things like, yeah, you've got some, some internal resources that are unnecessarily exposed probably. You're unnecessarily increasing the attack surface. Well, let's put those things behind a VPN, right? Let's minimize your perimeter attack surface so we have less to actually look at so that the, the credentials that we steal can't actually be used anywhere, right? Because now you're using multi-factor authentication as well, right? So things like that, these are just kind of, yeah, like Chris said, kind of our hit list of, of some of the things that we feel would be the most beneficial to organizations just to kind of mitigate things across the board. Now, when it comes to the reconnaissance part of it, that's probably a little bit more challenging because a lot of the data that exists is on a third party system, right? Um, previous, uh, I would say that doing your due diligence to identify information that has been leaked, for instance, in like a, a breach dump, something of that nature, and then proactively resetting that user's password on the domain to make sure that they're, they're not in sync anymore um, is kind of an, an easy win. But actually scrubbing that data from the third party is going to be pretty difficult usually. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so we, we had a question in the chat specifically around social media, and, and I think Dan just kind of nailed it there. Um, for, first of all, be obviously be careful what you're doing on social media or really any public site. Yeah. Um, and be, be aware of any sorts of breaches or compromises that do get announced, right? If Facebook announces something, um, maybe it's worthwhile actually scouring public resources of, of breach credentials or yeah. maybe even just proactively uh, rotating credentials within your organization if it makes sense. Yeah, and there's these services if you're plugged into, say, for instance, uh, Azure, right? Um, and you've got um, privileged identity, if I remember right, something like that. I can't, for the life of me, it's just escaping me. But you can uh, uh, you can implement that within your uh, Active Directory infrastructure on-prem ADDS, uh, and that uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's it's very similar to how I've been pwned. Basically, it just tracks like all of the uh, uh, the latest breaches, the latest uh, content from those breaches, right? And you know if your if your user uh, if you've got an enterprise user uh, that goes in and tries to use their password, tries to change their password. And it's found on any of those lists. It'll basically just say, "No, no, you can't use that. You need to change it, right?" So it's almost like real time. You know, it's uh, just it's it's you know it's just feedback that you can uh, you can actually implement. Obviously, that's going to come as a cost, right? But uh, it's uh, uh, it's a good thing to integrate within your environment. So mm -hmm. yeah, for social yeah, media, I think the, the uh, it's part of kind of the security awareness training, knowing what attackers like to look at on social media. Um, in terms of the example we gave for being able to recreate a badge essentially by looking at a, a social media post of the user saying they got a new job or whatever, things like like that, right? Have you know the organization look at that type of information periodically and scour it, see if anything is exposed, and and work with the users to try to know better and also to um, 
I guess, reactively remove stuff if they can. Yeah, perfect. Th thanks, guys. Uh, we're right up on the hour, so I think we'll close out here uh, shortly, but we will be sharing this checklist. And again, this was recorded. I guess just kind of closing thoughts on what was just commented. Um, obviously, the best thing we can do is prevent the, these types of attacks from happening. Um, but the next be best thing is to actually detect them when they do happen, right? And have some sort of response ready. So make sure you've got a response plan, you're testing it, and, and you're continually improving that. So. Um, with that, we'll close out. Uh, we will be doing uh, uh, one in the near future too, and we'll be covering cyber resiliency and kind of the assumed breach mentality, where we'll be talking about the solar winds incident a bit and uh, kind of what your organization can do to prepare for events like that. So again, thanks to Stack Titan. Thanks, Dan, Chris, for joining us today. Uh, very informative and we appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.